Hello all. Before we launch into this episode, I wanted to give one caveat, which is that the Wi-Fi is a little bit choppy, which is no surprise, given that this guest is in high demand and travels all over the world, and sometimes the locations, like in this case, don't have the best Wi-Fi. But don't worry, because you'll be able to hear everything and you won't miss any of the goodies. Enjoy. Hello, esteemed audience of Decoded. I am super excited for this guest. This person is a world-renowned stylist, and I mean like to the stars, a TV personality, a designer, and I just heard the former or former creative director of the NFL, and I am sure much, much, much more, but net net, he is a legend in fashion. So welcome, Mr. Philip Block, to Decoded. Good to be here. Good to be here. Philip, I used to watch you on TV. I follow you. um, And I really mean it. When I found out that we were going to be connected, I just was gleeful. This is is so (laughs) great. I love fashion. Uh, I love how you approach things. And then when we met, over Zoom, I just fell in love with you. So uh, this is gonna be such a great conversation. First and foremost, Philip, did I miss anything in that, in that repertoire of uh, accomplishments that I mentioned? <laughs> a lot, but uh, you would have to introduce me for the whole, whole time if, if you had to put everything in. I've, uh, I've designed a Ken doll for Mattel. No way. I've done 13 movies. I've produced two films. I'm working on documentary films now. I've written two books. Um, I was the first fashion editor at Vibe Magazine. I mean, I've done a lot of really interesting things over the year. And I started as a model, kind of breaking glass ceilings with diversity back in the 80s. So I've had a long career in fashion. Wow. I'm very, very grateful to it. And it's it's interesting where fashion can take you. You kind of think, oh, I'm going to be one thing or another in fashion. And yet there are so many opportunities. Yeah. I think when you love what you do, you know, there's that saying, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. So um, it's definitely stressful, the, the industry and doing all the different things I've done. You're constantly learning new things about different ends of the, the industry. And as the times have changed, I've been in this business. Wow. Four decades now. It's my fourth decade in fashion. Four, four decades finished. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. That's amazing. So yeah. you, said you started in fashion quite young and what, as a model, yes, but, and then you transitioned from being a yeah. model to being a stylist. What, what kind of got you, I mean, you could have just stayed being a model. What kind of triggered this interest in being a stylist? Oh, I definitely couldn't have just stayed being a model. I mean, it, it was great. When I started in the industry, nobody was different looking. Everybody was a 42 reg and they were very athletic and it was just a very all American time in the industry. And, um, I kind of broke through, I was very ethnic. I had a hard time working in America and I, I worked as a busboy at studio 54 with David LaChapelle was a busboy also. And I saved my money and I ended up going to Europe to start my modeling career. Interesting. What do you, what do you mean you were ethnic? What, what did that entail at the time? What did that mean? I really, I wonder myself, you know, <laughs> I think it's really interesting. I, I did a, a, a fashion show for the Super Bowl a couple of years back with Vogue magazine and the NFL at Grand Central Station and Pat Cleveland was in it and Cara Young and Carol Alt and a bunch of other, uh, other great models. And, and we were talking about the industry and how, you know, in the eighties or Susan started in the seventies. And she said, Oh, I was so ethnic at the time. People wouldn't give me a job because I was too ethnic looking. I said, Oh my God, when I started in the eighties, the agencies wouldn't take me because I was too ethnic for America. And they were like, Oh, you have to work in Europe first or Japan. And so that's what I did. I saved my little coins and uh, (laughs) I went to Europe to, uh, to start my career. And I started in London and Europe was just so much more ahead. You know, there were models like Veronica Webb who was very right. unique in the time as well. And, you know, there were a few kind of groundbreaking models in that time, but, you know, I was short for a guy. I was like five, 10 and a half on a good day, maybe 5'11". <laughs> I think I finally grew with that extra half inch. I wished that half inch on myself. Um, 
And, and I, I managed to work. I did Gautier's shows, all the beginning Gautier shows and Galliano. I did Galliano's first fashion show at the time because I was unique looking at it. And I think it was a time where models had a vibe. You know, if, if you were unique, you had to have an interesting personality. I, I was, I spent a summer hanging out with Gia and, wow. um, you know, I just, I always had a, a kind of cool personality, I guess, a unique for the industry and, and people like that. And I, that's how I got my work. I didn't get my work because I was the perfect model. I got my work because of the personality. And I've always learned in the industry since then, there's millions of beautiful people, especially if you look on Instagram now, look at all the sexy people half totally. naked and they're all Instagram models. But beauty isn't why you're brought back. You get hired because of your looks and then they bring you back again and again and again because of your personality. And it's interesting, I was just uh, chatting on uh, Instagram. I posted some pictures from, from the modeling days in Milan and I'm still very good friends with the editors uh, that were my editors. This is back in 1980. And they were my editors and they're the ones that convinced me to be a stylist in the middle of my modeling career. They were like, you should be doing something else. You have a lot more talent. And I was the model that walked in and they'd always say, oh, leave your jacket on. Don't touch his hair. Leave it the way it was. I had wild curly hair. And, you know, they were like, don't touch his hair. Don't leave, leave your jeans on or leave right. your leave your leather jacket on. You know, because I was, a, I was that guy with a cigarette hanging out of my mouth, Doc Martens and a black leather jacket and... I worked at Comedy Garçon at a small point in, in New York also. So I had this amazing wardrobe that they gave us. So I lived in that, my Comedy Garçon wardrobe, which nobody wore all black in, in the eighties. Like nobody mm. wore black if you were going to a funeral. Right. So yeah, that progressed to the styling that led me right into yeah. the styling. And it's, again, it's about your personality. You can be talented, you can be amazing. You can be as fierce as you think you are, but it's, it's your kindness that really matters in the end and the ability to be able to, be friendly with people and and they're still in your life many many years later uh, four decades later <laughs> right that's so amazing to hear and you know philip like i felt that kindness from you right okay. and um so you're you're expressing it still every single day of your life and you have this joie de vivre like when i said let's just do this <laughs> <laughs> I go to session I so. and you're the superstar and I'm just me and you're like well why not you know and I think um it goes it goes really far and people do I, I agree with you it it it's karmic joie de vivre is such a great expression and and slightly underused these days because it really is just about the joy of life and the joy of what you're doing unfortunately the times have gotten extremely complicated now there's a lot of people involved in the industry that just weren't here before I think people do it for the wrong reasons. I think people do it to become famous. And I, I never really wanted to be famous. I did everything I did because I loved it. In the times that I was styling in Hollywood and I was working with Sandy Bullock and Selma Hayek and Jennifer Lopez and Nicole Kidman. Oops, did I just drop something? Yes, about a hundred names. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I loved what I was doing and I would go places and I'd be like, oh, Sandy this and J-Lo this. Well, she wasn't right. in J-Lo then for this and some of that and people would like sometimes roll their eyes the fashion people in new york would be like oh him and celebrities but obviously again i was kind of in the right place at the right time for that and it was because i loved what i was doing i wasn't being pretentious i wasn't showing off it was just what my right. day was and i loved what i was doing right you know i um even though i have a a, a very different life than you though i think there's some overlapping um, i think so <laughs> I, I mean, I do like to be in front of the camera, uh, but I think, I, I think that you and I share a lot of uh, commonalities because I have this totally the same attitude. My, the, the way I express it is I say, follow the love. Yes, and that's great. The love, great. you will end up being, you know, I studied anthropology. I mean, people used to look at me like I had three <laughs> heads. Like what that, and I have taken that exactly. with me every single step of my career because it's my love. And if you love something, you can translate it and reinterpret it. And it sounds like that's why you've been so successful because you've been able to reinterpret your love in so many different ways to help people. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you think that the role of fashion and style will just revert back to what it was once we're all getting the vaccine or, or do you think it's gonna, change in some way walls of the walls have come tumbling down the walls have, have changed everywhere I, I i often say that um 
the white man put up these walls around the industries for many, many years. And, and some people got over the wall. And I, I was one of the last people over the wall. I, I definitely feel like, you know, in my fashion career, I was able to break glass ceilings, go over walls with being shorter, being different, being not the average model. And I, I was part of that movement when it happened, as it, as it began to happen in fashion. Um, I think I was part of a more natural movement. I wasn't the dyed in the wool, fall, 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 fall. I was a homeboy. I grew up in the streets. I was selling drugs when I was 12 years old. Like I was a weed seller. And when I was 12 and hanging out, I've always been part homeboy, part fashion person. I'm very, um, what's the word? I, um, I'm kind of really a contrarian, you know, I'm yeah. one thing, I'm the other thing. I'm a little bit of everything. And I think that now those walls have come down with social media, there's no more wall. They can't contain everybody anymore. Those walls are never gonna come back up. Fashion is about diversity now. And it's interesting because fashion wasn't created. Clothes are for diversity. Fashion was not and, and is not created for diversity. High fashion is not created for the public. It is created for a very specific group of people. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the fact, you know, it's, you know, a designer sits in a room and doesn't necessarily, a real, creative genius designer, uh, the Pradas and the Ray Kawakubos of Comme des Garçons and, and the people that I grew up with, the Jean-Paul Gaultiers and, and, you know, those kind of designers, Jean Galliano, the people I've worked with, um, they create a, an idea, a, an inspiration. The problem with separating fashion and putting it in for everyone is it takes a lot of the aspiration and inspiration out. And that's a lot of what I feel is missing from this new generation of kids and social media. We don't, we hate on the aspiration and the inspiration. They want it and they want it now. And if it's now and it's not about them, then they're not interested in it. You Which know, I, I feel is a little sad. I feel it, it's funny, not funny, but it's, it's interesting you say that because and I, maybe I'm drawing a connection that, that you won't hear, but I think it's there, which is I really, really miss glamour. I, I don't mean the magazine. I mean yes. glamour. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, particularly now, we don't have access to that glamour. Like we, and, and then I, I also wonder to your point, like there is a role for glamour and, and, and I mean, I'm curious if you feel like yes. after COVID, in a way, we 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 may be yes, there may be, yes, there's going to be a space for democracy and diversity. But I also wonder if there's going to be this this feeding of the glamour and inspiration hunger. I don't know. I'm really after that Vogue cover of Kamala Harris. I don't know. I, I really, I really don't know. I think that so much is based on sales and business and the business of fashion mm. that we've lost a lot of what the, the main ingredient is the fat, the inspiration and the aspiration, the, the desire for opulence and the desire for, for wanting more. I think fashion and the photo shoots we would look at always showed us more and it was it was put there so that we, we would want to achieve that and we would want to go to these places where the girl was eating the mango lisa Rael or lisa taylor were eating a mango on the beach and some right. beautiful bathing suit and jumping through the water janice dickinson was somewhere going you know, <laughs> like you wanted that i don't i think there's going to be a big i think there's going to be a big calling for it after everybody gets out of the house because i think it's been just so like Yes. Here we are in the house. I just did CNN for the inauguration, and which I thought was a great day for American fashion. I have to say, I thought that was a great yeah. revival of American fashion. We saw so many designers that we didn't know before and ethnic designers being used. I, I thought it was a really important day. They for leaned American into the fashion. moment. It was almost like a kickoff for, yes. for a new beginning. Yes. They really did. The, the glamour girls, the Hollywood girls brought the glamour and the Washington ladies brought the elegance and the, and the dignity. The Hollywood girl showed you the aspiration and inspiration, J-Lo all in white, Gaga right. and Scaparelli, Katy Perry in Tom Brown, that fireworks moment was, that fireworks moment, the Gaga moment, right. and the J-Lo moment are what's missing from the world of fashion right now. Those, those inspirational, aspirational moments. And 
then Michelle Obama and Kamala and, and Jill Biden brought the classic, elegant, this is how you do it at home. You know, totally. your coat matches your dress with your glove match. Totally. And I'm okay with that. I'm good with that. I like both. There's yeah. still one totally. is I, I, One is inspirational, one's aspiration. I'm Philip Block and I don't consider that I have a brand. Ralph Lauren has a brand. I have this whole attitude towards what's your, you know, when people say, what's your brand? I'm like, okay, when you ask me that, you're putting me in a box and you're limiting me. And I want to be like Philip Block. Who writes books? Who does movies? Who does TV? Who who's a fashion designer? I, you're, you know, if you had to pick one brand and they put you in this box, then you wouldn't be able to step over the box and out of the box. So. It's so interesting with like Instagram is is a big uh, subject because people always say, well, why don't you post fashion on your Instagram thing? You always post these political things. You always post these funny things, and, and you put some fashion on there, and you put pictures of yourself on there sometimes. But why don't you put more of that? And I'm like. Because I'm more than that. <laughs> I am Bingo. political ideas. I am funny and I like funny things and I like fashion and, and I like God stuff. I do a lot of God stuff and people are like, you know, you do a lot of God stuff. And I'm like, well, yeah, how'd we get here? <laughs> you know, like, gotta be grateful to somebody for something. Totally. You know? But what are you up to mm. next? Oh, wow. Um, for the last five years, I have been banging against walls. I, I decided that I wanted to create films. I wanted to continue to tell stories because that's what, what a, a true creator does. You tell stories, whatever your medium is, whether it's dance or singing sure. or fashion is right. my, my template. And um, so I decided I wanted to continue stor telling stories. I, I wanted to create films. So I've been working on documentary films about um, black history actually and civil rights and and black beauty and and things of that things in that world and and um i've also been working on uh, a lot of true stories about people in fashion and and things that have happened i, I can't get too into that one but right, but right. true true history about things that have happened in fashion and, and iconic stories that i think should be told and and haven't been told the most creative times came after pandemics. In history, the Renaissance was after a yeah. pandemic. So we are in for a great time coming in. And I had a lot of creative inspiration during that time. I actually created these three other series that I think are actually gonna go somewhere as well. Wow. Go, go somewhere. That's very important. But the really interesting thing about that, so that's important as the positive thing. I should have ended with that because that's the positive, but I'm gonna go back to the negative for one second there is always going to be the creators and the money people and the money people are not creative. There are a few Oprah's a creator and she's a money person. Ava DuVarnay is a creative and a money person. Tyler Perry is a creative and a money right. person. Our creative money people. Gwyneth Paltrow is a creative and a money person. Jessica Alba, these, a lot of the people that are making their products, et cetera, are creative and money people. But in general, the money people, are not creative and they don't have a creative bone in their body and that's where the five or three years of arguing comes in about the power of who's getting what right. credit whose name goes first and who's getting the money we should share that because we are stronger together you um, have ideas i have ideas let's put our ideas together absolutely i love that let's let's end it on that because um i do i i really wholeheartedly agree with that i i think the world has evolved towards realizing it's it's not a zero sum game anymore and that we will win together and we will flourish together. So I, I'm really inspired by all the things that you've been able to do up until now, everything that you're about to be launching, your, your, your comment about, you know, it took a pandemic, it took some harsh moments to sometimes break open the creativity and the inspiration. Absolutely. And I, I truly believe we're, we're going towards a future that is going to be more inspired, that's going to be more creative, that's going to be more loving and empathetic, and that's going to be more collaborative. And so I can't wait to see, Philip, all of the goodies that you are going to be sharing with the world in a few months' time. Um, and maybe I can bring you back on the show to talk about those. Exactly, exactly. I like that. I like that. Great. I hope, well. I, 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 I know things will happen. It's not about giving up. I've never been one to give up, 
but I do believe things happen in the right time. And so you have to have that patience. This has been about patience. One of the most important things for everybody to learn in this time has been patience. Like totally. chill the book really out. hard. <laughs> it's been really hard. Um, but, uh, but I hear you patience with a dose of optimism absolutely. or vice versa. Absolutely. That's, right? that's absolutely it. That's yeah. our optimism with a, with a dose of patience. patience. Exactly. exactly. That'll be the bumpers. That'll be the hashtag. Again. Thank you for having me uh, decode a little bit of my career in the fashion world. I think we definitely decoded some things here. Me too. Me too.